Hello, I'm William Spots, and welcome to the bonus program. This program will serve as part director's commentary and part finishing of the state floor, since we still have the family dining room, and an incredible secret silver collection most people don't know about. Do join us to see the rest of the interiors of the White House, and thank you for making it all the way. So here we are, back at the White House. Gee, doesn't Program 1 seem like years ago? Well, I mean, for those of you who are watching this after the sequential posting of these various programs, it won't seem like long. But for us, uh, Program 1 is several months ago, if you're watching this uh, soon after it's been posted. Here we are back at the White House, and uh, it actually reminds me of something. The, uh, two things, really. First of all, the structure of today is going to be a lot more loose, since this is, of course, the bonus program. So we're going to have a lot more fun, and it'll be somewhat more informal than the three heavy uh, programs that we went through um, these past couple of hours. What we'll do now is I will go through um, a couple of stories that did not make the final cut, uh, the best ones that I thought were really super interesting. I had to cut, essentially almost one story per room in order to keep it under the 90 minute mark that I wanted. Otherwise, this would have turned into one of those, you know, full day seminars where I'm just expounding upon every interesting piece of information. Um, it, it never would have worked. And if I had included every piece of information I had found or had thought was interesting, we would have been looking at a 6 p.m. Pr premiere and like a half past four finish. <laughs> So for those of you who wake up early in the morning, it would not have worked well for you. Anyway, so first I'll go through a couple of stories that I think really, it's a shame they didn't make it, so I put them in here. And then after that, we will continue with the family dining room and examine the beautiful silver collection that is uh, not very well known at all in the White House. So here we are back at the White House. A lot of people asked me what uh, the purpose was for choosing this specific image from the national calendar in 1822. They said, what are you choosing calendar images for? What's going on here? And really, it, it was um, for good reason, because there aren't that many great images of the White House. Here you can see that uh, the one I chose for today is, you know, a, a huge file, uh, pixel-wise. It's from the late 19th century. The file isn't, but the image it, it uh, has is, obviously. Um, and people said, well, what, why do you choose that specifically? Or why have you chosen this one specifically? Because do you know, people don't realize how many crappy images of the White House there are out there. Here's an example from, I believe, 1801 or 1802, right after John Adams moved in. It's a charming little picture, but it doesn't really make for the sort of stately, beautiful aesthetic I kind of wanted. These are everywhere, you know. So I chose this one because it's, it's you know, 7,000 by 10,000 pixels. And it's just, it's just a beautifully artistic representation of the White House. You can see it's very accurate. Um, I don't know if the drive would have gone that way. Most days, uh, most times nowadays, people will drive up, going exactly the opposite direction of where the carriage is going. But it could have been different during the 19th century. Um, usually, this happens because if you're driving past the White House and you drive on the right then you're going to want to make a right turn into this loop and then drop off your passenger and then continue on. Although it's possible that at some point Pennsylvania Avenue was like a one-way street coming the other way, so coming from the far left of this photo. So then you would have turned left into this loop and then just gone into the, the left-hand lane. I don't know, but either way, it spurs some interesting thoughts. Um... Here's a picture that I thought, it was really a shame that it didn't make it into the, the final program. This is another very high pixel file of Government House. Do you remember the, the Customs House we were talking about in Program 1, I believe, where um, it was built for the presidents, but he never lived there? This is just a more beautiful image I've seen. Um, and anyway, it, it's just a nice picture that really shows you how inspired by these previous buildings the White House was. So here we are back in the modern White House, and you can see that uh, we're back in the entrance hall. The first very interesting story that I wanted to share with you was about the winter enclosure. Do you remember this, these pictures? I mean, I've, I've zoomed it up on the right so you can see it. But if you remember from program one, I talked about the winter enclosure being this thing that was added during the 1960s in the winters to make sure that every time the White House door was opened, it didn't create this burst of wind where the, the hot air would go out and the cold air would come in. And uh, the plenty of people who enter the White House through this entrance every day, important people, regular people will enter 
through uh, less dignified entrances in the east and west wings. They basically used this to keep the draft out. I had a sneaking suspicion that this was an old idea, but I didn't really realize it until I looked back at this picture, which you'll also recognize from, I believe, 1889, or rather, uh, yeah, 1889. And if you look on the left, you'll see that there is the exact same sort of thing. I realized that right after I published Program 1, and it didn't really fit into Program 2 because we were done with the entrance and cross halls. We were already in the East Room, so I had to wait until the premiere of the bonus program to show you all that this winter enclosure is actually a very old tradition, and it's not the sort of, you know, 60s Kennedy thing that I thought it was. If you look on the left, you can see that there is a sort of winter enclosure here. So it at least goes back to the late 19th century, which is which makes it, you know, uh, something like 75 years old by the time the Kennedys are using it in the early 60s. And then I thought, well, maybe I can get smart and find a real picture of it. So I was perusing around, and I, I was looking in Architectural Record magazine. I thought they're, they're sort of the newspaper of record when it comes to architectural things, much like the New York Times is called the newspaper of record because it's got all the important events of the world. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll look into Architectural Record magazine and see what they've got. And lo and behold, I find this picture, which, as you'll see, wasn't um, included in Program 1 because I didn't know it existed, of the other side of the entrance hall, after the Roosevelt 1902 refurbishment. And lo and behold, what do we see on the left-hand side? It's the winter enclosure. Not only is it the winter enclosure, it is the same one that we see in the Kennedy years. Here you can see I've superimposed the picture from the, the Kennedy years on top of the one from the Roosevelt years. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing, but the door handles are the same, the, the panes of glass are the same, and that uh, the rim on top with that decoration is exactly the same. Exactly the same. So it's possible that this winter enclosure, it's different from the original one, I believe. If you look here, it looks slightly different. Although I could be wrong if you look on top of it. But it, it, it's possible that the ones that the Roosevelt's used just stayed there, you know, being taken away during the summer and put back in the winter, la 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 la, for 60 years. It could be even older than that. So it turns out that this thing this little stupid piece of glass and steel has a huge long history in the White House. Who knew? You know. So anyway, that's, the, I think, a, a really interesting story that I, I'm so sad I didn't get to include in Program 1. But as I said, it was already hitting up against like 120, 100, how many minutes? It was like one hour and 28 minutes. It was impossible to, to add anything more. Here's another picture that I found. This is just a very big file of the room that you can see. Um during the Roosevelt years. And this photo actually allows us to do even more um, looking around than before. If we zoom in, you can see that if I play with the light, you, digitally, of course, we can now see what are in the metapes you know, between the, the triglyphs. Uh, do you see that? There's, uh, going from the left to right, there's a Roman sacrificial head. It's a, it's a bull skull. Uh, they use those during ceremonies. And then there's a shield and Roman swords. And then there's a Roman eagle. And then there's various other elements of Roman military garb. And then there's a suit of armor. And then a festoon and a wreath. And then another sacrificial bull. And the style starts again. So this picture gives us a, a perfect ability to read what the inspiration was for at least parts of the cornice and the entablature and all that. It's fascinating that we've, we're able to see these little plaster ornaments so clearly due to this picture. And then if you zoom in elsewhere, you'll see that we can also see the eagle that was implanted above the door to the blue room. Now, if you'll remember, when we saw other pictures of the cross hall, we saw that there was the Truman presidential seal above the blue room. And we th at least I thought that was sort of a new thing. Turns out I was wrong. And here is at what I at least assume is the very first eagle that stood above the blue room, the entrance. And it's this sort of stylized eagle within a wreath of what I'm assuming are laurel or olive leaves in this plaster rectangular plaque. Just very interesting, isn't it? Speaking of plaques, if you look on the floor between those two columns, you'll see this, which still exists. I just couldn't get a good picture of it online. It's, it was added, I believe, after the Truman renovation, and it shows various moments in White House history that were important. So there's 1792 on the left, that's the laying of the cornerstone of the White House, the cornerstone that no one can find, by the way. 
Then there's 1817, which is when it was rebuilt under Monroe after the War of 1812. And then there's 1902, when Roosevelt did his big renovation. And then there's 1952, when the Truman renovation, which was uh, four years long, finished. So this is sort of a nice plaque that informs visitors that these years are of some significance in the White House. And then if we look to the other side of the room, you'll see that piano that I talked about at great length during the first program, which has five scenes of American dance. Uh, I found a beautiful picture of the keyboard and the, the little plaque. This is the turning into the plaque hour, isn't it? Uh, that is featured on the Steinway piano. If you look at it closely, you'll see that it says, Presented to the United States of America by Steinway and Sons. It's very interesting. It doesn't say the President of the United States of America. It says the United States of America. And then here we can see a picture of the cross hall that I did not find until after program one and two. You can see that it very closely mirrors the other terrible, terrible picture. I think this wins the award for worst picture of the entire series. Um, it is just a higher resolution version of that. It's the original. And so here we can see what I was trying to get at is that on the left, this is probably the, the best picture we've ever had of the Tiffany screen. You can see every pane of glass, and I'm sure someone out there in my audience, since you're 3,000 strong now, uh, does photo recoloration. So let me know. I would love to see what this looks like. And then there's obvious uh, palms everywhere, because why not? It's the White House during the 1890s. And then there are those electrified chandeliers we saw. But this is the first real instance where we can see the sculptural uh, and plaster decorations on the ceiling and cornices and everywhere else. You can see that on the ceiling there are these beautiful circular patterns. I mean, I'm tempted to say they were added by the Harrisons, if you remember from program two, I believe it was, where we talked about how the Harrisons were in love with adding circular medallions and motifs on their ceilings. I don't know if they're the culprits, although this looks like the type of thing that Chester Arthur would have added, not the Harrisons. Anyway, maybe we should add it to the Harrison myth just for fun. So this is a perfect um, picture because it shows us what the cross hall looked like. So you can see in the back, we've got the door to the east room. So we're looking east here, meaning like the, the end of the room is east. And then on the right, we have a giant mirror. Presumably these, these giant mirrors are here in order to make this, the hall look larger since it's now closed off by the Tiffany screen and then is populated by these plants, which then makes the, the space seem even more cramped. And then if you keep looking, you'll see that there are various huge life-size portraits, both flanking the, um, the door to the blue room and above the door to the blue room. You can see that the portrait, again, just like that one in the red room we saw, is inching into the entablature and cornice decorations, which is very interesting. Anyway, I just thought that would be something fun to show you. Also, because you can see the pattern on the carpet. How often do we get to see that in those pictures? It's very intricate. I'm assuming it's a Persian carpet. Um, blame it on your Persian host, I guess, that he thinks it's a Persian carpet. But anyway, here's another picture of the cross hall that I posted on the channel a couple months ago, uh, right after the premiere of Program 1, because I found it right before a Program 1, or right before Program 2 was published, rather. And it's a dinner during, I believe, the Harrison administration, so like 1891, 1892, and uh, you can see that they've been using the cross hall for a long time for dinners. Biden has used it a couple times recently for dinners, as you can see. But it's really an old tradition. It's very interesting that we've got this attack of the plants here. It seems that Roosevelt really wasn't original in that uh, type of decorating style for state dinners. So, back to the modern cross hall. This is near the door to the state dining room, which is on the left. The door that you see right here. Um, goes to the usher's office, I believe. And so above it, there is this very inconspicuous bust of Lafayette, who is looking at another part of the room, which is very interesting, because if you look at that other part of the room, you can see that there's a sculpture. So it's sort of like Lafayette is interacting with the other sculptures in the room. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm not sure it was intentional. It probably wasn't. But it's very interesting that they put a statue of Lafayette looking at a 45-degree angle, in the same direction as the other sculpture, which just happens to be a woman. I, don't, I just found it very, very funny. So then here we are in the East Room. Um, as I said, we're just going through the stories that, are, that I find interesting before we get to the family dining room. And I, you remember I briefly mentioned the very expensive carpets in Program 1. 
Well, or actually, I believe it was program two. Well, you'll you'll tell me in the comments, I guess. By the way, when I'm done with this, tell me what your most the most interesting story was from program one, program two, program three, and the bonus program. I have to know because there are so many of them. I've forgotten half of them, and the other half I can't choose because to me they were all part of the work of making these. So though I love them, I can't decide because some of them just represent a lot more work I had to do than others. Anyway, you're, you'll remember that I mentioned the highly expensive carpets. And when I was looking, I actually found the price of the carpets. They were ordered, apparently, in 1990. And their design is supposed to emulate what the ceiling moldings and designs looked like during the Adams administration. So this would have been John Quincy Adams in the late 1820s. So it was woven by Edward Fields Incorporated of New York and, quote, paid for with private donations raised by the White House Endowment Fund, the carpets were designed to cover most of the floor to protect it from dirt and the occasional pebbles, pebble stuck in the tread of a shoe. That sounds pretty good, except for the fact that they cost $259,330. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty expensive for a carpet that's supposed to catch dirt and the occasional pebble stuck in the tread of a shoe. If you're going to put a carpet down to protect the floor, then I would assume you'd want a cheap carpet so that you can keep replacing it and it wouldn't that would never look dirty. These ones already look faded. I mean, I've tried to color correct it somewhat, but it's just whatever I do it looks faded. So the fact that you're standing on a $260,000 carpet that is designed to keep you from scratching the floor is just funny to me considering these are hand woven and the designs are historical. And then here you can see the ceilings, which, you know, it got me interested because this rug is supposed to look like what the ceiling looked like. So then I look at the ceiling, and the ceiling also has these little hints of inspiration. So you can see that altogether it's got a very interesting design where there, the ceiling is emulating a previous ceiling, and then the carpet is emulating another previous ceiling. It's sort of this weird mirror reflection historical memory thing. And then here we can see President Pierce. This is probably the earliest depiction of the East Room I could find. It just didn't fit into Program 1 or 2 because it didn't show any real architectural detail beyond what the photographs I already had was. So this is President Pierce uh, at a levee. So this is presumably a couple days after his inauguration. It's just interesting. You can see it in 1853. So this is three years before that U.S. Magazine article where I showed all those things. And then here you can see Lincoln lying in state in the East Room, which is a very sad thing, but it, it's at least a, a historic photo, so I had to include it because it, it, it's, of course, interesting. And it does show you those ceiling paintings that we saw multiple times in those engravings and lithographs and woodcuts. Here you can see what it actually looked like. So if you look up at the, at the top, you can see some of that ceiling painting that we just got to see. And then here we are in the Green Room, and the green room really just has one interesting story. I didn't really know how to fit it in. So I, I found this news article from 1962 where you can see that this mirror that was sitting above this beautiful roll-top desk between the windows is broken and there, and there are pieces of shattered mirror sitting on the floor and on the carpet. And I thought, well, A, why is this a news story? And B, why is it not cleaned up? Apparently, according to the White House Historical Association, here you can see their picture of the, the mirror, which has now been fixed. This mirror had a decorative urn thrown at it by some visitor who was angry. And uh, there was never any explanation. The New York Times doesn't say anything. The White House Historical Association doesn't say anything beyond that. Someone just took a decorative urn from... I mean, this is a visitor, so did they bring in the urn, or did they pick it up from elsewhere, where like two White House uh, artifacts damaged in the process, one were breaking the other. I, I noticed there's no urn on the floor, so is it possible that's a mixture of broken ceramic and broken glass for the mirror? I don't know. I just thought it was a very interesting incident that I didn't really know how it fit anywhere. This is during the 1960s, as I said, 1963. So just an interesting thing. You never expect people to be hurling objects in the nation's uh, house or palace or whatever, whatever, where it depends on where you live. I, I I never even thought about how dangerous it would be for someone to just fling, you know, their wallet or their credit card or anything, you know, in a room of these priceless artifacts. 
you know, all they need to do is like, chip the furniture and suddenly the value goes down $300,000. It's just a w sort of weird thing that goes on. And then we move on to the blue room. As I said, there's roughly one story per room. And you remember I talked about this Belanger set, which you can see is prominently featured in these pictures, where it was bought by Monroe in 1817, and then what's well, been reupholstered over several years, and then it's been reupholstered with eagles on it, which I explained why it was so ironic in Program 3. It turns out that the fire screen for this set has been found recently in fact a couple of years ago i believe this is 2020 it was found in i think someone's attic and then it was at auction and someone notified the white house historical association they said hey this is an auction uh, you, you might want to buy it since there's only 10 pieces of this set left in the world and they're at the white house so on the left you can see it when it's been stripped of everything apparently it had been upholstered in some sort of yellow it, it had been redone a few times it was in terrible shape as you can see and then on the right is after all the conservation, they chose this sort of nature-y floral pattern uh, that matches the rest of the furniture. And so now it proudly sits in the White House. And the body of the woman on the, on the left of the right pan picture is someone who was involved in the project. I don't know. And then here you can see some interesting pictures taken by the government um, in the 1980s, I believe, of different aspects of the White House. This is still the Blue Room. On the left, you can see a, a very good close-up of the door cases and you can see that it's sort of this very traditional design of what is this a sunflower or something like that surrounded by you know lamb's tongue decoration that sort of thing and then on the the right you can see the the gilt wood chandelier with its sort of crunched velvet uh, chain covering and then that ceiling medallion that you never see in the photos even though here it's somewhat distorted and then over here you can see that we're going into the Red Room. And the Red Room has actually quite a few interesting stories that were unfortunately left out. As the programs went on, more and more stories had to be left out because the programs ended up being slightly longer than I wanted. So it, it turned out I was droning on more than I, I had bargained for. So as we go on, there'll be more and more stories per room because as the, the programs went on, there was less and less time for everything, which is why... <clears throat> I've squished some of these stories into the bonus program. So anyway, here we are back in the Red Room with um, uh, Melania and the Queen of Jordan. And if we go back to the late 19th century, you notice that we saw this picture where there was the fireplace and various elements added by Chester Arthur and, and um, the Grants. Well, these vases, actually, I wanted to feature them, but I couldn't because I had to pick the best ones and these didn't make the final cut. They're actually vases made by Tiffany for Chester Arthur. Arthur was a very good friend of, um, I believe it was Lewis Comfort Tiffany who did the redo. I know that was one of our trivia questions, Trivia Tuesday questions a couple of weeks ago, so I should know, but, you know, chalk it up to irony. So these are actual Tiffany vases that were painted to show uh, Cupid being locked up for mischief, according to the WHHA. As you can see, they've got the there's the red door on the left, and so you can see Cupid in it, and then someone, perhaps Venus, is locking him away. And you can see that they are massive vases. I mean, that, there's that chair on the right. If the, if a person's sitting in that, that vase is going to be above their head. So these must be at least four feet tall, something like that. And you can see they come with their own plinth, and then in the right-hand picture, there's been another plinth added onto them so that they even more uh, have, have a place of prominence. They are supposed to copy, a, of course, an amphora, which is an ancient Greek vase. Sometimes it would hold wine or olive oil, things like that. And so they would have had some sort of top on it. Not this one, but in, in, the, in the ancient times, yes. And then they would pack these off on ships, especially the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire's olive oil was made in Spain, mostly. A lot of olive oil is still made in Spain. So they would put it in these porcelain vessels, of course, without all the paint and decoration and gilding, and then put a top on it, and then they would put thousands upon thousands of these on ships, and then ship them to Rome. Of course, Rome is this huge city back then, with, I don't know, a million people. It's the largest city in the ancient world, which is con just consuming olive oil like crazy. It's used for cosmetic products, just like today. People are rubbing it all over their body. They're using it in cooking. They're using it for light. Remember, there are oil lamps 
I mean, olive oil was just, it was like the way we treat water these days with our air conditioning systems. And if you want heat, if you want some sort of air conditioning, you have to have water. Back then, if you wanted heat, you had to have olive oil. Same thing with your cooking, same thing with your um, skincare routine. Although I'm sure there weren't influencers back then bothering you on social media with their new you know, sl slime or whatever they're putting on, the snails that they're putting on their face nowadays. I don't understand that trend. Somebody in the comments tell me why that's supposed to be useful for you. I have no idea. Anyway, these vases are supposed to copy the form of an ancient amphora, so both of these together would be amphorae, which is the plural of amphora, a Greek name, of course, and then the design copies, the design rather, what's painted on and the gilding and the styling is supposed to copy an early uh, 19th century vase, so it's sort of a neo-neoclassical thing. So the original was from ancient Greece. The neoclassical was from the early 19th century. And then this is not a reinterpretation of the classical, it's a reinterpretation of the neoclassical. So we, we're now, there's like rabbit holes in, upon rabbit holes upon rabbit holes of historical reference here. Because the neoclassical movement built upon classical motifs, but in a stylized way. And then this vase is then piling on even more. So we've got... Uh, a classical neo neo classical style. I just think it's funny that it's all piled on like that. And then a few years later, of course, the red room was redecorated to look like this. Those vases are still there, of course. And beneath that portrait of uh, Mrs. Tyler are these two sculptures, which I think are the oldest objects in the White House, which is why I wanted to mention them, but it didn't make it into the final cut because they're so far back there that I thought I might as well feature more prominent things like the tables and the electric lights. The two sculptures, as you can see here, still exist. They're in the White House collection today. The one on the left is uh, Giuliano de Medici, Medici, excuse me, everyone mispronounces it, including me, and Lorenzo de Medici. Um, Lorenzo de Medici was ruler of Florence during the Renaissance, so he rubbed elbows with Michelangelo, Botticelli, people like that. Very influential. These these are presumably actual Renaissance bronzes. The White House Historical Association claims they were made in the 1520s, although I suspect they're 19th century reproductions, but I'm going to go with what they have to say. These might be the oldest objects in the White House collection. So that's interesting. I mean, to have real Renaissance bronzes in the White House, that's something you would expect of, you know, the, the Pierpont Mont Library or the, the Frick Collection, not the White House. So I'm I'm very glad if they are real and if they're... 19th century reproductions, well, then those people had good taste, whoever was making it. And so we get back to the Red Room today. Here's a beautiful picture of Mrs. Biden taking around a couple of people. This was early in the administration, as you can see, because they're wearing masks still. You can see that uh, Martin Van Buren is still presiding over the room in that marble bust we talked about in Program 3 with that beautiful bracket, the gilded wood, and then I think it has Verde Antico on top which is holding him up there. And then below him, and below the rest of them, you can see this table to the right of the man in the blue suit, which is this beautiful sofa table that was made in the early 19th century. Um, we don't know who it was by. Apparently, it's in the style of Charles uh, Honoré Lonnier, who made that um, trompe l'oeil table we saw in program two or three? Program three. So clearly, whoever made this was a master cabinet maker. You can see on top of the veneers are perfectly done. Then the veneers for the drawers are mirror image of each other. So uh, excluding that middle section, the, the two drawers, the veneers are somewhat of a mirror image of each other. And then there's this caryatid with who has wings and she's supporting. There's two of them. You can see there's one in the back, one in the front. They're gilded and then they're supporting the table. And then we have these stretchers. They're not X stretchers, but they're just stretchers where they have this spiraling carved pattern, and then the feet are, are Verde Antico, they're stone. So then we move on to the state dining room, and I just wanted to feature this picture, which I didn't show, I, I believe, partly because it didn't really show anything beyond some people having a nice dinner, um, but it, you can see the ceiling, which it didn't feature last time. So it's a very interesting thing. This is mid-19th century, so this is like 1860s, I believe. I could be wrong. And then here is that picture of the state dining room from a few years later, I believe this is the 1860s, and so we can, or 1870s, excuse me, and so we can see those chandeliers that were added, and then if you look at the way back, I didn't notice this until after program three came out, 
Do you see that table behind the, the, the dining table, this sort of little, little side table with that spiral leg? It turns out that table still exists. Here you can see that table still exists. And if you look at it, you can see that this table has the most beautiful woodwork. Uh, and I can't believe that I didn't get to talk about it, so I'm going to talk about it now. It's made of walnut, and it was made something like 1853 by Anthony and Henry Jenkins of Baltimore. Four of them were actually made. I don't know how many survive, but this one does, since there's a contemporary photo of it. And it was put in the state dining room by 1867. So that's the first mention we have of it, but it probably comes from before then, since it was made something like 14 years before that. And you can see that it probably was made for the White House, since it has that stylized escutcheon in the center, where it's got the US stars and then the vertical stripes and all that. But really, those spiral legs in the back are just a, a masterful piece of woodworking. They're really like Solomonic columns, if you look at them, because they've got a sort of capital on them. And then there are these sort of 19th century, but also with a whisper of Rococo legs in the front, which are, of course are a little more showy, because why not? I mean, I, could have, I would have bargained for more spiral legs, but that would have made the table look a little dainty. And I don't think that's what they were going for back then. So then, do you remember when we talked about the fireplaces and how Theodore Roosevelt was so particular that he had the lions changed to bison and that I had found a picture of the lions and that's the first time it's been featured in anything? All the White House documentaries I watched, none of them had this picture. So I, it turns out I can, I can outdo myself because then I found a photo of the model for the bison. You can see way down there, this is the actual picture of the thing, which still exists. It says, to President Roosevelt. And then on the bottom, it's got a bunch of things. I think it says October something, 1901 or 1902. This is the actual model. So you can see it's, it's got a lot more detail, or at least you can see it in more detail just because of the nature of the color of this well, presumably ceramic tile. So anyway, how often do you get to see a model for a marble fireplace or marble anything in the White House? The, usually the models are, are all cast away after they're done. So this this little bit would have been what was proposed in order to replace the lion. So Roosevelt would have looked at the fireplace with the lions on it and then said, well, this is too European, I want bison. And then someone would have made this and shown it to him, and this is probably what changed his mind in order to have it replaced in this way. So this was very consequential in White House history. And so finally my ramblings are done, and we end up at the door of the state uh, of the family dining room. Excuse me. So we've gone through the state dining room and all of that, and we are now in the family dining room. The family dining room has basically been used as a dining room or something akin to that for all the centuries it's been here. There's a lot of detailed information on its size and, and various ways the room has been changed around, but it doesn't really matter because it's been used as a dining room for more than two centuries. So what really matters here is a design. The way it looks today is courtesy of the Obama administration uh, and I'm not so sure how successful this modern decorative scheme is because as you can see they're they're trying to artfully I use that word sparingly they're trying to do this sort of round peg in a square hole square peg in a round hole thing where they're fitting modern art what an oxymoron into the White House. So they've got a, a chandelier that's obviously from the late 18th century, or a copy of one from the late 18th century, and then a fireplace that's Louis the Sixteenth, with a gilded mirror on top of it that's with these weird orange candles that they bought at some pottery barn. And then on the left we have a painting. Well, I mean, it's, it's I think, too big of a compliment to call it a painting. And then in the far wall we have another quote-unquote painting, which is concentric circles, I know people value this stuff, but I'm sorry. Compared to the art that we've seen so far, I, this is really, it's of no value. So then, basically, the interesting parts for us are the fact that this, that this room has always been prized for the silver. The one good thing that they did put out, as you can see on that sideboard on the left, is a set of silver from the 1939 World's Fair, which I believe was in New York. I could be wrong. So anyway, here are the earliest pictures I found of the family dining room. These are both late 19th century. These are probably 1880s or 1890s, although I'm assuming 1880s. Where you can see that the room is basically the same, but it's of course very dark and heavy because 
of the Victorian aesthetic, and then they've got these terrible bar chairs, which look like they're from some... Uh, and somebody commented on one of my posts, and they said, I hate those bistro chairs. And I think that's a perfect way to describe it. I forget your name, commenter. I apologize. But I'm giving you as much of a shout-out as, as I can remember. Uh, he called them bistro chairs, and he's absolutely correct. They, they do look exactly like what you would find at a bistro somewhere. Anyway, so if you look here, you can see, as I said, that this treasured collection of silver and porcelain and all of that uh, accumulated in the 19th century and was proudly shown in, the, in, the, in this dining room. So as you can see, here's a picture of it a few years later with lighter um, wallpapers, as you can see, but still a very heavy design aesthetic because, as you can see from this picture, which is a hell of a lot of pixels. Thank God I could find it, otherwise we'd never be able to see the detail. You can see that the wallpaper and then the entablature and then the borders of the entablature and then the ceiling outline and then the, the, the other ceiling outline and then the, the inside of the ceiling are all different designs. So we have a sort of star pattern on this ceiling and then that's outlined by bars and then the outside of that is, a, is another pattern which is basically squares or hyperbolic squares inside of stylized circles and then we have a few bars and then the entablature is a pattern that's so complicated I can't even figure it out. So you have to give it to the Harrisons because this is their this is their design scheme that they've really I mean it's better than this I will give them that it, it's at least better than this super dark technique and they've added um, electric lighting as they did in all the rooms but finally because this picture has so many pixels we can start looking at various objects in the room so here is a vase I just thought I would add. It's a, a rose bowl, I think it's called, that still exists. It's in the White House collection today. So I thought it was just interesting that we can see this cut glass Tiffany uh, vase that was sitting on the table probably during tens upon tens upon hundreds of presidential breakfasts. I mean, it's possible the first ladies you know, personally arranged flowers in this vase. So even though it's somewhat inconsequential um, in a decorating sense, it is amazing in that it's really something that lived with the first families and was probably there during all of their dinners and breakfasts and because this is where they ate. Anyway, so let's get on to the star of the show, which is this sideboard, as you can see. So we'll go from top to bottom. On top, you can see that there are three pieces of porcelain. There's two fruit baskets and then another kind of... Oh, no, they're actually all fruit baskets. Here you can see that the one on the right, that's the one there are two of, and then the one on the left is the one there's one of. These are all from the Lincoln set, which is essentially Limoges China that was bought by Mrs. Lincoln because she obviously hadn't spent enough money. I mean, hello, obviously. She hadn't spent enough money, so she decided to spend even more money on Limoges China, which was made in by a Brooklyn firm in both New York and Limoges, France. And it has this sort of royal purple color. The gilding is all real and everything is hand painted and it was so well liked that it's it, it was reordered well into the 1880s and uh, it's still being used today sometimes. I, I think it was Mrs. Bush or Mrs. Obama when she gave an interview about the White House she was talking about how you know you think you're at home and then you look down and you see Abraham Lincoln's plate which shows you that either she just chose Abraham Lincoln as an example or they still do use this china. Either way it's pretty interesting. And then here we can see that there are various elements of the giant silver collection, which I have been hinting at this whole time. You can see that silver, well, I'll show you, but this, this conglomeration of silver has been accumulating in the White House. It still is, actually, because of private donations and things like that. It's been accumulating for over 200 years. In fact, there's some silver that was owned by George Washington, so it's possible you could even call it two and a half centuries old, this collection. But anyway... Uh, yeah, they're actually, no, that is true, because there are some early um, 18th century sets of silver in here, too. Anyway, so let's go through this piece by piece, shall we? If you can see that on the very front, there are all of these um, compots, or compotes, or compotes, or kimpots, or kim who knows. There are these six sort of, they're not cake stands, but that's what I'm going to call them, sitting in front. And those were bought by, of course, Chester Allen Arthur, who's one of our favorite household decorators here in the White House. And they're actually what I think is gilded silver. And then on the right, you can see an olive dish. As you can see, it's part of this wider set that was owned by, or that was rather made by Tiffany and then supplied 
to the White House at the request of President Arthur. You can see there's a cute little pepper shaker and then an oyster fork and what looks like a teaspoon. And then there's plenty of other silver. As you can see, there are these four pitchers, two on the left and two on the right, that are um, coffee pots and hot water pots. The hot water, I believe, is the bigger one. There's two of them. These were a feature of a 130-piece set bought by Andrew Jackson. This is the actual set bought by Jackson uh, in 1833 from the Baron de Tulle. I don't know how to pronounce that, but who cares? T-U-Y-L-L. Go figure. He was the Russian minister to the United States, and he was selling, or he needed money or something like that. He was going bankrupt, and so Jackson decided to take advantage of that and buy the silver set, which I believe is complete. And so if we look back to this picture, you can see, well, actually, I have a better picture. You can see that they have ivory handles. That's fun. And they, they, they're part and parcel of the neoclassical design. They were made in France, I believe, or at least made by a French maker. And you can see that they've got these um, paws for feet and then these um, anthemnions or palmettes uh, as the sort of finial on top of the feet. And then there are these handles. And then you can see the stems are somewhat stylized as well. They've got various neoclassical motifs that are ubiquitous. Here's another one which also appears on the sideboard that we just saw. I'm not going to point it out to you because it's way in the back, but believe me, I took 20 minutes verifying it. And I did it because of the tip of the spout, which as you can see I've zoomed in on. This is another part of that 130-piece set. I'm assuming there were multiple coffee sets and tea sets because these all were part of the same set, well, I'm using that word too much, but they were all part of the same package of 130 silver pieces that Jackson bought from the Baron, but some of them have different designs. So these ones have cloven hooves as feet, can you see, and not those paws, although all the other details are pretty much the same except for the finial, which looks like feathers or flames or something. But the most interesting part is twofold, one of which is the President's House has been engraved upon the silver. You can see right on the belly of that uh, coffee pot, it says President's House in nice cursive script. And then, of course, as I said, I've already zoomed in on the spout, which looks like a dog's head, is, which is very interesting. And then here's another zoom in where you can see the head, which is sort of like a mascarone, which serves as the mounting for this ivory handle. Uh, some of them are wood, some of them are ivory. I don't know what this one is, but it, apparently this one is ivory, although it's a black and white picture, so I don't know. I just love the, the cloven hooves' as feet. I think they're so cute because the, the shape of the leg and the, the diameter fits what you would expect a bovine or, or antelope <coughs> foot to look like. So it's just funny that it's so, it's so realistic. And then here's a gravy boat that's also featured, but again, I won't point it out to you because it's so hard to see. If you want to go back, it's on the very left-hand part of that spread that you see. And then over here, you can see that on the other side, there's another sideboard, which is filled with porcelain treasure. So as you can see right there in the center, which is also reflected in the mirror, there is Hiawatha's boat, which we talked about in program three, which was made by the Gorham Manufacturing Company. But as you can see, there's a lot more treasure here. So if we go through it quickly, if you look on the upper left, you will see that there are two round plates, and there are these plates. These plates are part of two different presidential china sets. The one on the left is from the Hayes service, and the one on the right is from the Grant Service, which it, um, I talked about briefly, I believe, last time. The Grant Service is interesting because it was commissioned by, well, both of these sets, the Hayes set and the Lincoln set and the Grant set, were all Republican politicians' wives who spent way too much money on everything. So Mrs. Lincoln, wife to the first Republican president, spent a hell of a lot of money on their China set, which, of course, is I'm not making a political statement. I, I love the fact that they bought it. It's just funny that they spent so much money. And then after Johnson comes Julia Grant and Ulysses S. Grant, who buy the set on the right, which is hand-painted Limoges porcelain, and each one has a different wildflower on it, which has been hand-painted. And then on the left, we have the Hayes service, which is after them. So Lucy Webb Hayes wants to add her own ginormous collection. So this is a 562-piece set of China, which has 130 individual designs. And so this one is a design of what looks like a, an Indian basket, a woven basket. They call it Indian. I, I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, 
I thought it was supposed to be a fishing net, but I was wrong. It's supposed to be some sort of Native American Indian basket. And then if we look back to the picture again, you can see that what flank Hiawatha's boat are these two punch bowls. And those punch bowls are from the Lincoln service. They still exist, as you can see, and they're huge. And so you, you have to imagine that there's a giant ladle and then cups surrounding this during a party. So people are dipping their the ladle or their cup, which is also common, uh, into the punch and then drinking it, which is like alcoholic fruit juice, basically. And then if we look back again, you can see that above Hiawatha's boat, above the mirror, there is this plate of this turkey. And if you look to the sides of it, you can also see that there are two other plates. These are all from the Hay Service of ducks. And that's a scene from Chesapeake Bay. So if we look more closely, you can see that the one from Chesapeake, or it, it depicts a scene at Chesapeake Bay. You can see on the left is a picture of that plate and with its upturned corners. And then on the right is just an assortment of the Hayes China. And yes, those are all part of the same set. It's, it's, I told you, it's like five, it's 130 different designs for each different plate. And there's 562 plates. So there's like something, there's like four of each plate, something like that. Or there's, or there's probably like a hundred different types of serving dishes and cups and all of that. And then the dishes that you actually eat off of, there's like a say, set of eight for each one. Who knows? And then if you look over here, you can see that turkey dish. And I, I found an original design for the turkey. I flipped the turkey dish so that the turkey in the design and the turkey on the plate are, are facing the same way. So you can see that even that twig on the lower right-hand corner was featured in the design in the upper right hand corner, upper left hand corner, excuse me, of the design. This is very interesting. You never get to see the design. And it also gives you a lot more detail regarding the feathering. It's because the, the pencil drawing is a lot easier to see than, than what you see on the porcelain. I love those sun rays coming out from before the turkey. Here is the little Cupid sconce that's in the White House. You can see that it's sort of this little inconspicuous wall mounting that provides a little bit of light to that part of the room. But apparently this is one of the or the first electrified appliance that was in the White House. It still exists since, of course, there is a photo of it. But I just thought it would be interesting to show you this little bronze brass sconce made in 1891 by the Harrisons to just illuminate that part of the room. It's very interesting. Anyway, so here is the room after Roosevelt has redone it. You can see that there is still silver on the sideboard, although it's a different sideboard now and there's a little bit of a different assortment. So basically what we've done is we've stripped everything off and Roosevelt has made it quite grand, really. I mean, he's he's put that picture of John Tyler in a place that I think is absolutely perfect. It fits right in there. It's the right size regarding the, the room and the size of the space. I think it's perfect. And then he's added what looks like a china cabinet in the back. And then these uh, faux Chippendale chairs, which surround this round table, which was there before. And then if we look, you can see, as I said, the, the same silver is around. It's rotating. But there, this picture is in a large enough file for me to show you what each piece is. And then we get to the, the Truman renovation. Here's an interesting photograph where you can see that there's an even earlier design that was preserved because it was not like not painted but in some way it was stuck onto the walls the plaster that's above the bricks and so when they tore everything away it was still there it's very interesting and then over here you can see what the roof looked like and the reason why I have a picture of, a, of the roof is because that's how that was the last straw when it came to Truman making the decision about whether to uh, re renovate the White House because Essentially what had happened was Truman's daughter Margaret had been playing piano in the above rooms and this is 1948 and one day the leg of the piano while she's playing it so you know tinkle 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 boom the whole leg bursts through the ceiling and into the family dining room and it was upon this strange occurrence or upon learning of what had happened that Truman decides, that's it, my family can't live under this death trap anymore. We have to get out and we have to rebuild. So he moved across the street to Blair House and they rebuilt it. Anyway, so here's what it looks like having come back from the renovation. Everything looks pretty much the same. You can see that they've restored the Roosevelt vaulted ceiling, which is different from before. And we've got the same sort of rug and that portrait of Tyler and the, the chandelier, as you can see bef from before. 
Here's what the Kennedys did with it. You can see they kept Mr. Tyler there, President Tyler, I should say, but they've now painted it this interesting yellow color, which actually stayed for a while, which is why these this video is, or this part of the video is going a lot faster, because there weren't as many changes to the uh, rooms that weren't state rooms. So this room stayed the same until the Kennedys, who then changed it, and it stayed the same until the Obamas, and we just saw what the Obamas did to it. So I can go into a lot more detail, because there weren't as many radical changes. Here you can see another picture of the other side of the room where you can see that there is this eagle motif atop the part of the vaulted ceiling and if we zoom in here's another beautiful picture. I like the the black and white uh, because it, it shows more detail. If I showed you this in color you'd be looking at other things like the paintings and all that but if it's black and white then it, you can really see the plaster work well. Here's a zoom in of that eagle and you can see it's typical of these Roosevelt eagles he's putting everywhere. It's just like the one he put above the door of the blue room, where it's an eagle which is somewhat uh, ensconced or encircled by uh, an olive wreath, which is then detailed by grapevines, which are going around and around and then swirl off into nothingness. And the grapevines, I'm sure, were put there because this is a dining room, and so it's very traditional to put that as a motif in the decoration of a dining room. And then we get back to the modern day, really. But there are two pictures I'll show you because the family dining room doesn't always play, you know, this charming little room where presidents can have more private lunches with their officials, which they usually do in the West Wing anyway. It often is the place where waiters, White House butlers and whatnot, will prepare before serving a White House state dinner. So here you can see in their trademark 1970s tuxedos with gigantic bow ties, uh, and mustaches, the White House butlers and waiters and footmen serving lobster at a White House state dinner. So this is where they would get all the food plated and then they'll get ready and then the door to the state dining room opens and they pr process through with the food. I just think it's very funny that despite the fact that the butlers at the White House have been wearing black tie for over a century, they're still at least somewhat subjected to the, the ebb and flow of, of um, historical trends regarding fashion. And then here we can see it serving this exact same purpose uh, in the Obama administration, although this time you see that there are female waiters as well, waitresses. And they've, their suits have also been affected by the current trend. So right now what's very trendy is having very skinny lapels and very small bow ties. Everything is small, you know, slim fit. And so here you can see, especially on that man who, who has that very thin bat wing bow tie, that everything thin, tiny lapels, it's all sort of funny. And in the foreground you can see the White House chefs who are plating the dishes right there for you, and then they will put it on a plate and bring it out. So that's really it. Um, aside from a few other details, here you can see one of the air grates. I thought this was very creative. I had to hand it to Roosevelt, or I, I think this is actually um, Truman recreating Roosevelt, or perhaps it is original. Uh, where he is putting an air vent, but the air vent is so beautiful, you you don't even notice it. There were several cri um, critics who commented on uh, something like this being put in during the Kennedy administration, who then complained that it, it ruined the room. I'm not sure it was actually this one, but if it was this one, they were complaining about nothing, because the way it's been done is so elegant. I don't really mind it at all, do you?